This is the Bill Press Show. It is the Bill Press Show. We are not live. We are on tape. We're taking the week off for the holiday and hope that you get some time off as well. But don't worry. We are leaving you with lots of new content uh, to absorb while we are on vacation. But we'll be back just after the beginning of the new year. I'm so excited. I wanted to make this happen for a really, really, really long time. Because I, of course, do the Bill Press Show. I, I write about food every now and then. I don't write about it as much as I used to. But I, 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 I like restaurant, the restaurant business. I like restaurant news. I like to absorb all things food culture. And so this morning, I am lucky enough to talk with two of my favorite people in town. Like I, I love all the food writers in town, but you two are my favorite. I'll just put it out there. Thanks, man. Uh, it's Laura <laughs> Hayes from the Washington City Paper and Jessica Sidman from Washingtonian Magazine. Ladies, thank you for joining me. Hi, thanks for having us. Good morning. Okay, so let's let's start first of all uh, with some unpleasant news because this year has been a year that we've looked a lot at uh, Me Too allegations, specifically regarding the restaurant industry. Um, We've seen some very, very big names uh, lose entire empires uh, over, rightfully so, I should obviously point out. Uh, Mario Batali was everywhere, and now he is nowhere. Uh, There have been multiple, I mean, yeah, we'll we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that. (laughs) Um, You know, John Bash is another name that I think of from Louisiana, but right here in Washington, D.C., we have our own. Uh, scandal involving the Me Too movement with Mike Isabella. Uh, For those of you who are not in the Washington, D.C. area, you saw him on Top Chef. Uh, He branched outside of the Washington, D.C. area uh, with a couple of different restaurants, but there uh, uh, there were some allegations of uh, uh, him misbehaving and acting very inappropriately uh, in his restaurants to his uh, employees, which resulted in which we saw near the end of the year, a complete loss of his restaurant empire. Uh, Let's let's talk, first of all, we all know the allegations. We've talked about him here on the show before. Um, How big his empire actually was? Well, he had at least a dozen restaurants. He had airport, kiosks, stadium deals. He had an entire food hall under his name, uh, 41,000 square feet. $40 $40 million. Uh, huge. Yeah, yeah. Huge, huge um, imprint on the D.C. area. You know, he was at every event, every fundraiser. Everyone knew his name. He was kind of the go-to celebrity chef in D.C. besides Jose Andres. Yeah. Who is, who who is, in, fact, under. Who is in fact, very, very good. Uh, <laughs> like, to counteract the bad stuff we're going to talk about, Jose Andres seems to be pretty perfect. Right. Um, but... You know, it was hard to go anywhere in D.C. without saying Mike Isabella's name. Whether, like, as you mentioned, at the stadium, uh, at airports, at all of this stuff. And so then these allegations come out, and he sort of fought them, right? Yeah, this is the part that drives me crazy, is I think that we could be having a totally different conversation right now. Um, After the allegations came out, if he settled quickly, if he publicly apologized with immediacy... Um, if he told the world he was going to rehab for six months um, and came back and, you know, said he was going to commit X number of dollars to changing his work culture, bringing in experts. Um, I don't know if he would have deserved to come back, but he certainly would have had a shot at one, I think. Um, but instead, he just um, kind of denied and denied until he did that one segment on Fox um, 5 News here Um but, yeah, I think that this could have been an entirely different situation if he handled it differently. Um, Jessica's reported on how there was more things going on behind the scenes than just um, the sexual harassment allegations yeah. about the, the rapid um, growth. But it's just the way that he handled it was just severely disappointing. I, I think the rapid growth was definitely a big part of it uh, with, with the downfall, right? I mean, when you spread yourself that thin – and you put yourself out there so much, it doesn't take much to just send the whole thing crumbling down. Not to mention, like, a sexual harassment scandal, which is very serious. I mean, that just brought his complete... I mean, so what is the future? Because it was, again, towards the end of the year, we saw that these restaurants are are done. Mike Isabella's restaurant group is right. no more. 
Well, so he filed for chapter, his company filed for chapter seven bankruptcy, which is basically liquidation. Yeah. And like initially he filed for chapter 11 where you try to reorganize and come out um, stronger at the end. Uh, but yeah, he, you know, all of these restaurants, I think the, the one thing that may happen here though, is he has these other business partners George and Nick Pagonis, yeah. who were also accused of sexual harassment. I was going to say, they were mentioned they in were, this. Yeah. But, the, you know, much lower profile names. Uh, and so I think they haven't gotten as much um, of the attention. But they are angling to maybe pick up some of these restaurants and operate them under their own names going forward. You know, we'll see if it happens or not. Yeah, that's, you know, you know, as you as you mentioned, Mike Isabella came out of Jose Andres kitchens. Mm -hmm. Uh, There have been a lot of people who have come out of Mike Isabella kitchens. Mm -hmm. Um, So you have to wonder about what lessons they learned while working in those kitchens. That's true. What's actually surprised me and, and been pretty telling is that kind of none of none of those folks really kind of came out to bat for him uh, like Marjorie McBradley um, and and uh, Mike were pretty close and she had a great year she opened St. Anselm and she's crushing it over there and she was I think strategically very quiet um, as were some of the other people that were kind of in his close circle um, everyone kind of just distanced themselves but uh, yeah in terms of just what it was like working under him um, that's like the scary part because, you know, what lessons did these, these folks learn? And, um, as far as the Me Too movement, you just hope that, um, some of this, these younger crop of chefs that are coming up, yeah. um, are kind of breaking the mold, uh, breaking the circle, I guess is what I meant to say. Um, so that they can instill different values in their, um, employees and kind of, it, it restarts the whole cycle. It, it, it is going to be very interesting because I think a lot of, legitimate businesses had to uh, put things in place to address these these types of terrible behaviors by men in the workplace. And, you know, I used to work in restaurants. You've covered them for a long time. You know that the restaurant industry breeds terrible behavior. Yeah, and, and the thing about it is it wasn't even really much of a secret. No, it was something no. that's been glorified in... TV shows and movies and pop culture, you know, the screaming chef. And now all of a sudden people are realizing, oh, wait, actually that's not okay. Yeah. And there's an entire generation of people who worked in kitchens who, for whom that was acceptable or encouraged. And, you know, we're in a whole new world now where that's no longer the case. Yeah. You know, it, I, I <clears throat> when we talk about this, I think a lot about uh, Anthony Bourdain, who wrote and sort of glamorized and glorified that sort of pirate lifestyle of working in the kitchen. And in his first, you know, couple of books, he wrote about it as if it was really like, especially the womanizing part of it was just part of the industry. Now, to his credit, before his passing, he he came around on a lot of these issues and really supported a lot of women in the restaurant industry and, and even called himself a feminist there towards the very end. But, you know, we did as a culture glamorize uh, how women are treated when it comes to the restaurant business. Yeah. And the one thing we're not mentioning here is that you can't divorce this from the substance abuse that runs rampant in restaurants, right? That's, yes. That is like the the like spark that's lighting this fire um, continuously. And, you know, Anthony Bourdain wrote about it in Kitchen Confidential and that it's just so, such a part of this culture. And um, it's been interesting to watch because like drinking, I think, is still the number one thing. Um, some restaurants still, you know, include a shift drink, um, a yep. drink right when you get off work as part of your kind of benefits as, as measly as they probably are other than that. <laughs> um, but it's been interesting to watch as like Top Chef became a show and the Food Network came about um, and just these chefs have become much more um, like celebrities than the, the guys that were kind of tucked back in the corner that you didn't know much about. And so the kinds of drugs and they're using has changed, I yeah. think. Um, it's, you know, no one's doing cocaine on the line. 
uh, back there where they're in this open kitchen because every right, right, if yeah. you don't have an open kitchen these days, just quit. <laughs> Very hot right now. So it's interesting the <laughs> turning to like more dangerous drugs that you do in private, and um, but it's it's the drinking that I think again fuels this whole thing. Right. So I, I actually I'm glad you mentioned that because this is where I wanted to go next. Um, I I don't get out to a, a ton of industry events. I, I every now and then uh, I'll get out to some. Right, I used to do a few more. But I uh, have gone to some of these food industry things a couple times where Mike Isabella was there. And every single time that I was there, he was stuttering drunk. Just absolutely, completely hammered. And this is a theme that a lot of these, you know, terrible men bring up when they're facing these allegations is, I was drinking a lot or I was doing drugs and I was like, I'm not responsible for my behavior, which is a total cop out. But also at the same time in the restaurant industry, you're surrounded by this stuff. I mean, it's very hard to get away from this stuff. Right. So what sort of I mean, I don't want to say that that is the fuel to to your terrible but to a man's terrible behavior. But it is a factor. Right. Right. And and he has admitted uh, that, you know, he is an alcoholic. He's been drinking his entire life since he was a teenager um you know he told us he'd pretty much <laughs> gone cold <laughs> turkey so you know that's a, you know i i mean alcoholism also is a disease it's sure. not it's you know it's difficult um so i don't want to you know belittle that aspect of totally. it no i don't either I, I i think it's a va- i mean i i think it's a legitimate part of the conversation that we should be having 100 percent. but and you also have to keep in mind that yeah at some point this guy went from being a chef to a like basically a ceo of a major company right. with thousands and thousands of employees um and that's what happens with a lot of these chefs you, you sometimes your talent is in the kitchen and sometimes your talent is business and a very few of them does that venn diagram kind of overlap <laughs> So th- th- that's th- I, you're, that's exactly right, mm-hmm. and I think that you know the days of running a really good restaurant and just getting in there and hustling on the line, like those days for a lot of people are over. You want to run several restaurants. Uh, the thing that that was most illuminating to me came out of the John Besh story, where there was a woman who was being sexually harassed um, in his restaurants. Uh, under his eye and she, someone asked her you know did you ever tell anybody and she said we didn't have an hr department right. we had nobody to tell there was nobody to tell and it it's sort of to watch the restaurant industry sort of turning into an adult <laughs> and realize that like you can't just wing it if you're going to be a big empire as you said there were multiple Mike Isabella restaurants, right. you have to factor in all the stuff that, like, you know, an actual business has to factor in. And they and his company didn't have an HR rep until last fall, at which point the company was about to, you know, have almost yeah. a thousand employees. So, um, but that's know, it's, fairly it's common, just an indi- right? Yeah, no, it's an yeah. industry where there's just not that HR isn't usually a part of the restaurant, you yeah. know. And I, I get it. Like I know sure. I've done a lot of reporting this year about um, the slim profit margins in restaurants. Bon Thai, my favorite Thai restaurant, makes seventy one cents off of its best dish, for example. So there's not <laughs> these are these are micro businesses, right? Um, and they're I mean every single dollar um, usually goes to labor, so it's just not feasible for a lot of these small businesses. But I think at a certain point, um, you know, there's things that can be outsourced. You know, sure. I just and mm-hmm. if you want to survive, like maybe this is something you want to prioritize. I actually, I, this is a little bit of a tangent, and we'll kind of get back to this a little bit later on, but uh, about the the Me Too stuff. But uh, about the profits, mm-hmm. uh, I think there are a lot of people that think you open up a restaurant, you've made it. No. You're like <laughs> you're like rolling in the money, right? It is not the case. No, it is not the case. <laughs> so so. I mean, obviously, I know that there's a difference between you know someone who's running one restaurant and someone like Mike Isabella that has multiple different restaurants. But how, how is it that uh, these smaller restaurants make it in a place like D.C.? What is it that gets them by? Magic. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. If you're, thinking about, if you're thinking about starting your own restaurant, folks. Yeah, it's it's 
I mean, it's really, it's not what people think it is. Yeah. I mean, there's so many factors that go into it. Do you have um, a smart lease deal in an area where you're going to be able to get traffic? Do you have a a good team? Do you, you know, are you good at, um, you know, sourcing and pricing and all of this other stuff that actually has nothing to do with food at all? Right. It's not about can you cook? Yeah, I mean, not to say that, that that's that not important. You <laughs> yeah, know, yeah. if you have great food, you'll bring in a lot of people. Sure. But sometimes restaurants that you think are very successful because their food is, you know, well acclaimed, aren't run very well as businesses and ultimately fail. Yeah. And the biggest problem, and this is staffing, and I think this factors into all of that, and and this that's been one of the biggest stories this year is there's just no staff. Um, and so I think. Yeah, these restaurants are going to have to spread themselves even more thin and offer better benefits. Um, most restaurant workers I interviewed this year do not have health insurance. Yeah. Um, and so I mean, that all these things, uh, restaurants are being asked to kind of k- pick up their game and, and start acting like regular businesses. And um, I think that's why, you know, towards the end of 2018, we're seeing more closures than we're seeing openings. It's been a little bit of a bloodbath. and. Um, I just, yeah, there's, they're being pulled in lots of different directions. It is certainly not a money bin. Um, yeah. yeah. On the economics of the restaurant business, uh, this is something that we've seen around the country, but here in Washington, D.C., we had Initiative 77, um, which would raise the uh, uh, wages for um, uh, waiters and waitresses to where they would get paid a set income. They won't have to rely on their tips anymore. Um, t- tell us, a, get us up to speed a little bit about the history of this. <laughs> sure, this has been my whole life since April. It's, I mean, it's uh, crazy. Ask me anything. <laughs> oh, good. Okay, good, 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 good. All right. Um, this is, it's been utterly fascinating and, and frustrating and illuminating and, and so many things. Um, I'll try to do the cliff notes. So basically a uh, New York-based group called Restaurant Opportunity Center United um, got a ballot initiative on the June primary. Um, which, as you said, its goal was to kind of eliminate this tip credit system where um, restaurant owners basically ask customers to subsidize their labor um, by make by paying the lion's share of workers' wages uh, with their tips. And um, the if, if 77 had taken an effect, it would have um, increased the tip minimum wage, which is currently $3.89, in eight increments up to $15 in 2025. From then on, everyone would be paid um, the $15 directly from their employer. Um, what I think the most confusing part of this that everyone kind of got tripped up on is um, tip workers are already required to receive the minimum wage. Um, so if tips do not carry a worker um, over that $15 mark, or right now, excuse me, it's three, $13.25, mm. then the employer is on the hook for the difference. Um, the main argument is that the systems kind of create some gray areas and it opens people up to um, greater wage theft. Um, so uh, the voters um, said, yeah, we want this. Um, it, I believe it was like a 50 to 40 um, vote. Um, it, was a, it was a convincing win. It was a convincing win. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah, it was a convincing win. And then um, almost immediately, the D.C. Council started mobilizing to overturn this thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> Which was amazing. And, and they did. Yeah. Yeah, and they overturned it. And they overturned it. So, you know, this was a really tough issue uh, for a lot of people uh, because we here on the show, uh, speaking for myself and for I mean, we're, we're progressives. We want to see this, this wage happen. Uh, but at the same time, Everybody I know who works in the restaurant business, who either owns or manages, uh, we work with someone who uh, works here in the studio who is a waitress, uh, and she hated the idea. She loved the tip-based system. And the restaurant industry seemed to hate the idea. Well, the thing of it was that a lot of restaurants thought that this is basically going to put them out of business. I mean, if you think about the amount of money they will have to pay, um, you know, the additional money they'll have to pay yeah. for labor, it is a quite significant sure. amount. So how do you deal with that? You maybe have to increase your prices. You, um, you know, a lot of places we're talking about, let's get rid of tipping altogether and have some sort of service fee, which we don't have to give to the servers or bartenders or 
tipped mm. workers, you know? <laughs> so, we'll love that. So, uh, so, yeah. And there, so there are a lot of arguments that in the end, actually, maybe these tipped workers wouldn't get paid as much, um, that maybe it would put a lot of places out of business, that they wouldn't be able to hire as many people. Um, you know, and, and we don't really know exactly how it would have played out, but there's a lot of bickering on both sides. So my issue um, with it, and in reporting this, um, yeah, I've talked to about 160 tip workers and only a small handful of this um, said that they support it, but that doesn't necessarily mean those people aren't out there. They just may feel intimidated or sure. whatever. Um, but the thing that I, I could never wrap my head around and why I don't think this is the perfect solution, this industry needs a significant amount of reform, but this group that came in, they said, you know, we want to help low-income earners in this industry who are uh, minorities primarily. Right. And if that were true, Initiative 77 would have in some way helped the people in the back of the house in the kitchen because they have a ceiling on their income, right? They can't un earn this unlimited amount of money. Um, and w are they ever going to get a raise if you're paying the front of house who already makes more money, more money? Yeah. L l let me ask you this. <laughs> Because one of the big arguments was, oh, if this happens, we're going to have to shut our restaurants down. Restaurants won't open. Blah, blah, blah. There have been multiple cities that have passed something similar to Initiative 77. They they started paying their tipped workers more. <laughs> well, I mean, you look at Seattle. I can't think of anybody that really, <laughs> like, I don't think anybody's really suffering from it. I, I mean, it's hard to say, right, what what place doesn't open because of that. Fair. Or, you know, That's fair. It, or how much bigger or more growth there might be with different um, sure. so i don't it, it is hard to say but you look at like seattle where they're raising the um minimum wage to tipped minimum wage to 15 dollars mm. an hour which is a lot um i mean i was there over the summer and it's booming there are tons of new restaurants and it's a very lively scene that's getting a lot of national attention yeah. too so you know that that's yeah. that's true What's interesting is some of the states, there's seven states that currently um, don't have this TIF credit system in place. And a, a lot of them, like this, it hasn't been a, in place for 30 years. Right. Um, so they're not trying to kind of retrofit the system with yeah. this new policy. That It's already kind of been there and they've built their businesses over time. But the places that opened here in the last five years, they opened, you know, understanding that, you know, this is how labor works in the city. Yeah. And so they would have to go through a, a tremendous amount of change, which... I don't. I don't actually think it would be this doomsday. Every restaurant would close. I think there'd be some um, tightening and shrinking. Um, but I do worry about um, job cuts. Yeah. Not not restaurant closures, but job cuts, especially the people like the support staff, the bussers and the barbacks. Um, I could see a restaurant owner eliminating those jobs and just asking the server to do more. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, I could I could certainly see that for sure. You know, I, for me, what it comes down to is like. I think we just, like, we don't want to pay what we should be paying for, like, a nice night out, right? Like, we want to pay as little as possible. As a consumer, we want to pay as little as possible. And I think that the hard part is for restaurants to say, hey, you've been paying this much for this long. Well, things change. We want to pay our workers a living wage. We want to make sure that everybody's getting, you know, their fair cut. We want to make sure everybody feels like they're taken care of. And that means that your check is going to be whatever. Ten dollars higher than you thought it was going to be. Twenty dollars higher, than, whatever. I, I'd pay that for every time I go out to eat to know that everybody there was take well taken care of. I mean, you say that, but I would also say probably one of the number one things people complain about to us as food writers is how expensive everything sure. is. And oh my god, That's what I'm saying, this taco's five dollars. Oh my god, this cocktail is like fourteen dollars. And you know, in a lot of cases, um, they're not even really making that much money off of it. I understand. But that's what the cost of labor and ingredients, yeah. especially for quality, yeah. really requires. It's it's a mental thing, though, because yeah. I read a study that, that showed that, I mean, you still you either pay higher prices or you pay a lower price and then you tip. And it ends up being pretty close. But just like the, the yeah. actual the obligation, it, you know, the is it's just changes people's minds. It's right. fascinating. If you get a bill for one hundred dollars. In your mind, that's, you know, it's $100 for dinner, right? But, like, if you're paying what you should pay and you put, you know, gratuity and all that, you know, it's – would you rather pay the $100 and then $20 on top of it or just $120? That's all – that's literally it. It's fascinating. Like, psychology <laughs> is fascinating. 
That's nuts to me. <laughs> yeah. It's a mind game. Yeah, it totally is. <laughs> okay, so uh, I, I want to come back to the Me Too movement just for very quickly. Um, is there any sort of redemption for Mike Isabella uh, and any of these other people who have been uh, have been accused of this stuff? I just want to mm-hmm. – I looked uh, towards the end of the year. Mike Isabella put up an Instagram post, which I'm sure you both have seen, of a wolf baring its teeth. Say, saying the comeback is always greater than the setback. So, will he be coming back? I don't think anytime very soon. I mean, uh, you know, I think there are certainly things. You know, there's a certain camp of people who say these this behavior is unforgivable, no comeback whatsoever. I think there is still a large group of people who would say, you know, if you do the right things, you know, get help, make the right apologies, take the right actions, uh, you know, atone for your actions. Sure. Um, that, you know, there should be some kind of path for you to have a career in this industry. I mean, this is an industry that also famously gives people second chances, whether they're um, you know, convicts or whatever other troubles they've had in their life, that the restaurant industry is a place where everyone is welcome. Yeah. So, you know, is, should that be the case here? I don't I don't know what the answer is. I think he's going to swing for it. I don't think it'll be in D.C. I think mean, he's getting, getting out of Dodge. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's probably what will happen. And then you have to wonder if he ever actually even learned anything. Uh, if he doesn't have to pay... You know, I mean, look, he's paid a very big price for it. I don't want to say he's not paying, but like, if he's able to still go and open restaurants, even if it's somewhere else, we'll just have to see. Okay, let's talk about positive stuff. Let's talk about positive <laughs> stuff. 2019 is here. Uh, dining trends. I oh, want to talk dining about trends. dining trends. I always love this. Just to, <laughs> like for you to, we're gonna put you on tape. We're gonna hold you to this. Oh my what gosh. do you see coming in 2019? Uh, that that diners will be uh, seeing more of. Oh dear. Well, the, okay, the food hall trend that's still that's very still much thing. on the rise. Yeah. Um, uh, Middle Eastern flavors. I think we're seeing a lot of those. I'm just kind of going off the top of my head here. Sure. No. So. That's, that, I think that's great. <laughs> um, a lot of communal kind of dining. Mm-hmm. Have we reached peak Poke Bowl? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah no, it, it's over. It's like over it's and done over. with, right? Yeah, we're done with that. Okay, that that right, bubble right. is about to burst. Yeah, so. it's so, oh boy. Yeah, hopefully. Fast casual will continue to be, I think, the fastest growing segment um, in terms of dining, um, especially as we see what ha- kind of happens with labor. Um, yeah. That's a, a different setup. But um, I think just like higher quality fast casual experiences, um, a lot of data driven um, type stuff. Um, these places are kind of towing the line between like what's too much information to just enough information to make you feel like you had a really personalized experience. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, that that sector continues to fascinate me. I think the cuisine that had the biggest year in 2018 in DC was Indian food. We've mm-hmm. gotten a whole mm-hmm. just rush of Indian restaurants, which is great. And there's still there's a couple more planned on the horizon for 2019. Um, so a lot with like with Middle Eastern flavors, with Indian flavors, I just think that um, I don't know, like maybe this like new America thing that like everyone's been obsessed with for the last couple of years is maybe starting to take a, a little bit of a backseat to some kind of more exciting cuisines. Yeah, good stuff. OK, one final one final thing, uh, because I know you always talk about the really expensive cocktails here in Washington, D.C. <laughs> Have you been to the Trump Hotel and had one of their. Twenty-six dollar gin and tonics, or whatever. I mean, I, I'm not kidding, by the way. They charge like twenty-five dollars. <laughs> they're a they're even more expensive every time you go. I feel like. Oh man. But, you know, okay, I've been there a few times okay. more to just check out the scenery totally. and, and people watch. Totally. Doing your job. You're doing your job. <laughs> doing I get my it. job. I get it. It's not a special bar, you know. It's not like they're doing really cool uh, cocktails that are worth twenty-five dollars. They're just charging a lot for really basic shit. Yeah, or that's it. Say really basic well, you just stuff. did. Okay, it's okay. Sorry. <laughs> uh, but, that, but that's it. That's it, right? That's all they're doing. What yeah. was that drink they made you when you said your dog died or whatever? Uh, we So we did this little experiment where I went to the, this different bars okay. with different scenarios oh. and had them <laughs> make me a drink. Yes. So one of them was um, I just got dumped. 
I went with my husband, actually, which was really <laughs> hilarious. This is my rebound. We're already married. <laughs> and the bartender was like, oh, you're such a good friend to my husband. That's hilarious. Uh, that, and then we, I did one where I said, my dog died. I don't have a dog. But <laughs> and then I and then the last one was I went to the Trump Hotel and I said, I, I just got fired. Uh, you know, bartender's choice. What can you make me? And uh, they made me a, a, a sugar rimmed lemon drop <laughs> <laughs> and charged me nineteen dollars for it. Yes, <laughs> it's like that's just what I want if I just got fired. Wow. A nineteen dollar lemon drop. It's a little toned down. It's a little toned up, but shouldn't come as a surprise. Okay. All right. Laura Hayes, thank you so much for joining us. Jessica Sidman, thank you so much. I'm so glad we finally made this happen. Please come back soon. This was so much fun. Thanks for having us. And thank you so much for being here during the holiday week. We appreciate you tuning in. We've got more holiday programming all throughout the week. Thanks for uh, joining us. Stay tuned.